before we get into the um, agenda is um, we do have a plaque here um, recognizing Jim Murphy for his decade of service to the commission. Um, Jim couldn't be with us today, um, but I did want to at least um, you know, acknowledge his service here at the meeting, and we will get the plaque to him um, as thanks for his years of service. Um, I'd also like to welcome our newest member, Scott McNamara. Um, Scott's been in the Oneida County DA's office for, I think, 23 years. Is that right? In DA 15? Is that no, eight. 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 All right. I was going to say, I thought 15 was a long time. Um, but I, I've worked with Scott um, for years through the DA's association. Um, you know, he's got a lot of experience, um, both the state level and the national level, on issues that I think will be very helpful to the commission. Um, so we're very happy, very happy to have you here and welcome. Thanks, Mike. Um, with that, um, the first item is review and approval of the meeting agenda. We did <laughs> circulate the agenda. I do just want to indicate that I did speak with Barry last night. Barry indicated that he has a hard stop at 445 um, and has uh, matters both on the um, under the heading of new business and executive session that he wants to be able to participate in. Um, so the only um, caveat or um, footnote I'd make with regard to the agenda is if we do get close to um, 445 and have not gotten to those items, um, I intend to move those up to accommodate Barry's schedule. Um, but with that understanding, um, do I have a motion to um, approve the agenda for the meeting today? I'll make a motion. All right. Any second? All right. All, any discussion or comment? No. All in favor? Anyone opposed? All right. That's approved. Um, the next item we have is um, review and approval of the minutes of our December 11th, 2014 commission meeting. Um, and again, I believe those uh, minutes were distributed to everybody. Um, any comment or discussion first? If not, do I have a motion to accept the minutes? All right. Barry makes a motion. Any second? I have a second. I'm all in favor? Anyone opposed? All right, next passes. Next issue on our agenda deals with accreditations. Um, Brian, do you want to take us through the accreditations? Sure. Under accreditation, Nassau County Laboratory had a full assessment, I believe, in New York City. Uh, Dr. Buffalino is there if there's any questions. So uh, we have the documentation in your binder. There's no vote required at this point. Uh, this is for informational purposes since ASCAD Lab has not reviewed and voted on this yet. Any questions or any discussion um, with regard to um, NASA or any questions for the director? Okay. The next item has to do with a surveillance assessment, and this is of the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner. I believe their staff in New York City as well. I believe Meredith Rosenberg and Tim Cooperschmidt are there from the laboratory. So there's an annual surveillance report that's there. Again, no vote is required. There's also a notification of uh, just a change uh, in, in management. So if there's any questions, again, both members are there. Next item is the New York State Police Crime Laboratory. Uh, again, there is a annual surveillance report. Uh, no vote required at this point, and there's also a notification of some changes in top and key management. And we have members here in Albany, if anyone has any questions. The state police has one other uh, notification they've provided, and that is the idea that they will be uh, ceasing doing glass work, not physical, but analytical work on glass. So this is something that there would have to be a vote since the commission would just reissue a certificate, a New York accreditation certificate. So there is a letter in your binders, and we have uh, Ray Wickenhauser here if there's any questions about that. So basically, they are currently certified to do glass work, and what they're saying is they want to stop doing that, and they'd like their accreditation to be amended to reflect that they will not be accredited with regard to glass work. Correct. What happened is they, they are no longer looking to do glass work. I believe they've already uh, notified ASCLAD Lab of that as well and changed their scope, so they're looking to modify the New York scope to be consistent with that. Right. It's a little bit of a pro forma thing, but just to issue a new certificate, technically they have to have a vote. Any questions with regard to that item? All right, if not, do I have a motion to reissue the New York State Police Crime Laboratory 
an accreditation certificate without the category of glass um, for the period covering um, today, April 15, 2015, through June 20th of 2018, which I assume is when their certificate expires? They're asked by the accreditation, correct. All right. Do I have a motion? I make the motion. All right. Do I have a second? All right. All in favor? Anyone opposed? All right. That carries. Hold on one second. Did Barry Was there abstentions? I didn't see Barry's hand either way. Did you vote, Barry? Uh, no, but I'll vote for it. Thank you. Okay. The next item is the Niagara County Sheriff's Department Forensic Laboratory. Again, an annual surveillance uh, visit. There is no vote required at this time. It's just for informational purposes. And Almac, the lab director is available by phone if there's any questions. Okay. Hearing none, the next one is the New York City Police Department. Annual surveillance report for informational purposes only. Uh, no vote required, and also a notification that their QA manager had resigned. My understanding is they indicated to us that the director is going to be the interim QA manager until they get somebody else? That's correct. I'm sorry, who is that that's resigned? The name of the person is that? Barat Lakar. Oh, okay. He's here. Okay. We we know any well. I guess that's for executive session to know why he was on. On this particular one, um, this individual had already re uh, retired from a different lab, so they had just left service after a number of years. In addition to retiring from one lab, being at another laboratory. I get it. Okay. Back to you. Did you do the OCMA? Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Last one, I'm sorry, is the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner Forensic Toxicology Laboratory. And again, a notification of change, uh, retirement of one member and another member named as acting. <coughs> that, that will end the accreditation update. All right, the next um, thing we have on the agenda is old business. Um, the first item under old business is an update with regard to the latent print working group. Um, I believe Dr. Corrado is going to give us that update. Yes. Um, I think at the last meeting we talked about, we had met in November, last November. Um, shortly after that, I sent a list of questions to uh, DCJS to get some information relating to their latent print certification program at DCJS, their current practices, and the possibility of um, some additional responsibilities. Um, we are waiting for those responses. In the meantime, I um, just recently sent out a canvas for some new meeting dates, so we're hoping to meet again in May or June, and by then we should have the responses back from DCJS. And I know that um, we are working on getting responses to those we've met. Thank you. Any questions with regard to the latent print working group? Keep that on the agenda then for report at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Next item we have under old business is an update with regard to the hair evaluation work that we're doing. Uh, Brian, are you giving that? Sure. So essentially what happened is based on the, the commission recommendation, the Office of Forensic Services uh, began looking at the cases that were identified by the labs. The laboratories within New York that performed hair examination between the 80s and 90s actually identified the first five inculpatory hair cases where there's positive inculpatory statements that were made. Um, those cases were then identified by a number to the Office of Forensic Services. The Office of Forensic Services then identified which jurisdictions were actually handling those. There's a survey, uh, like a little summary sheet that's in your binders you can take a look at. After we identified the jurisdictions, both law enforcement and district attorney's offices that were doing those, what we had done is we had sent letters uh, to the appropriate district attorney's offices to follow up. Um, in addition, what happened is uh, Commissioner Green and Commission Member Fitzpatrick had sent a letter to those DAs talking about the need for doing this. Um, there's, those letters were in your binder. In addition to that, there's also follow-up letters sometimes from myself, from our office, to district attorneys giving case specifics for them to follow up. Um, the little status sheet describes where we are in the process of actually obtaining the data. Uh, it is challenging because these cases are 30 years old and some of the information is in off-site storage or difficult to locate. But so far, everyone uh, in this response 
has been uh, very cooperative in helping us and working with us. There is one exception to that. We did send some letters as well to the Syracuse Police Department that have been non-responsive. Any questions with regard to the status on the hair evaluation? I guess what I would well, suggest... Oh, go ahead, Barry. No, the, the whole issue of the Syracuse Police Department, uh, I mean, this is an issue that's arisen before, has it not, with their lack of cooperation? It has. What I was going to suggest is that we um, put this on the agenda again at the next meeting. Um, at that time, we'll have more information. You know, obviously, with regard to the, you know, everyone else in the state who's cooperating, you know, we'll have a we'll have more information in terms of, you know, what what we've gotten back, what it shows, and then I think um, I'd also like to have um, Bill Fitzpatrick here before we address the Syracuse police issue and decide on a course of action. It, it does present a problem for us because they don't fall under our jurisdiction. Um, you know, so I, I don't know that we have the authority to order them to do anything. On the other hand, I, you know, I don't want to just walk away from it. So I'd suggest that we have um, OFS staff continue to follow through and collect information <laughs> with regard to everybody else, put it on the agenda for the next meeting when um, D.A. Fitzpatrick will be here and then address the Syracuse Police Department then and see if we can come up with a, a strategy. Um, I have a question <clears throat> just in general. So we're, you're, we're collecting all these transcripts from these trials. What is the plan moving forward um, from that? Do we know yet? Is, are we going to get a committee together, together yeah. to review those? Or? I think that has been the subject of some um, discussion or controversy, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, I think we're gathering the information so we can look at it and say, from this sample of cases, do we see a problem? Do we need to, you know, how many of them um, had reports issued? You know, in those reports, you know, how many of them had proper or improper conclusions? How many of them went to trial where someone actually testified? to the hair result. Um, in those cases where someone testified, you know, how many of them, you know, if any, had um, examiners who presented results in a way that, you know, might be problematic. Um, and then once we have all that information, to me, the first step would be to look at that as a commission and say, what, if anything else should we do to follow up on it, given what we see in this group of cases? Um, you know, to me, if in every one of the cases we see no indication of a problem, we may want to go one way. And if every single case we see what we think is improper um, conclusion or testimony being presented, we may want to take a different course of action. So, you know, what I've been advocating for is we get this information, um, we pull out the relevant pieces of it, and we look at it as a commission before we decide what the next steps are. I think Peter has advocated a different view of it at, the, at other meetings. Well, Peter just walked in the room, but uh, uh, one thing I think by the time uh, uh, all that's gathered, uh, I think it'll be pretty clear that if you're able to get the transcripts, um, uh, it, it certainly will be possible to use the same uh, standards of review uh, that the Justice Department itself is using in reviewing the transcripts of the FBI agent examiners as to whether or not their testimony uh, went beyond the limits of science. And uh, it's important to see those transcripts because in many of these cases that are public already that uh, instigated the review, uh, one can see that uh, there were efforts made uh, to testify uh, in ways that implied a probability statement that I think is now accepted as improper when the people were testifying about hair. So, Mike, what you say is, uh, uh, you know, I think right. I think we're not going to find too many problems uh, in terms of getting the same standards that were used by the Justice Department uh, so that we can look at the transcripts and reports that we have in here in New York. Sounds like we actually agree, Barry. I guess I'm just wondering if it would also help to have um, a technical expert 
I mean, I guess if we're just going to have the members of the commission reviewing the transcripts, would it be smart to also have a technical expert, hair expert, to, you know, <laughs> offer some insight to in case questions come up or something like that? And then the second thing I was also wondering, I don't know if it was included in this or not, maybe you can tell me, but um, I, I think it's also relevant for us to know if a, if a hair examiner testified in the case, was there also DNA analysis done on those hairs which may have supported or not supported what the hair examiner said? Because, that, you know, if I just I think it would be inf information would be useful to have as well. So you have hair examination. Did you also have DNA either way on that particular hair? On the same piece on of evidence. On the same piece of evidence. I do believe that that's one of the things we're looking at, is it not? I think if we're, uh, we haven't specifically <laughs> asked that. I think when we get things back, we're going to be looking to try and rule those out. Just one other addition I want to put in is, as when we look at an approach to take, you know, Texas, which is the first state that undertook this type of evaluation, is taking a different approach than DOJ. And I think when we get to the stage to do it, we should look at what both what DOJ is doing and what Texas is doing and see if we can have lesson learned from both of those experiences so we don't repeat any mistakes if there are any. <laughs> I, I haven't been in depth with those procedures, but I think it would be worth, before we define our procedure, to look at what other people have done and where they you know, where they potentially miss things that we can add or where we can do things better. Um, this is Peter. I like the idea of having an outside expert who we can consult with, but I don't think it should be a hair expert. Um, what the FBI acknowledged was after speaking with professors of statistics and probabilities that they realized that the testimony uh, was scientifically erroneous. So if we're going to have an outsider to advise us, I would suggest that the person be a uh, a professor in the area of statistics and probabilities, because that was the issue. If you recall, what, what prompted the uh, hair review and what is prompting the hair reviews in the other states is not whether or not hair microscopy uh, can validly uh, decide whether two hairs are similar or different. It's not that there was a, an agreement that, that it was valid, but, but that, that wasn't the point. The point of the review was the second question, which is assuming that one could microscopically determine that hairs appear to be similar, then what is the probative value of that evidence and what could you say probabilistically? And so the issue for the FBI at that point became uh, seeking input from professors of statistics, which they did, uh, and eventually coming to a statement. And I believe in Texas also they consulted people who were statisticians. So I'm fine. I think it's a great idea to get some outside advice, but it won't be from a hair expert because the problem uh, that we're seeing, and I think the problem you're going to see in the transcripts here, is that many of them seem to be making the same errors that the FBI were making or of the same nature as the FBI was making um, and that were being made in, in, in most states in the country. So, uh, so we, want, we want an expert, but that's who the expert should be. Why don't I have um, our Office of Forensic Services reach out to both Texas and DOJ and get more information on the procedures they used, including any experts that they consulted with, um, and that hopefully will help us. Well, I don't think we have to wait that long, Mike. I think we can simply, if you want to get a hair expert, I fine. I, I have no problem with that, but I'm saying before the next meeting we should have uh, uh, a statistician on board also who can advise us. Uh, you know, and, and there are plenty of them, and we don't have to just end down the road, so to speak. I think we're ready to move forward. Well, personally, I think I'd like the Commission to understand what DOJ is doing, and I'd like the Commission to understand what Texas is doing before we go out and start retaining people. I, I explained what DOJ was doing, Mike, if you six months ago or more when I first brought this up. And I actually shared with this commission the documents from DOJ where they were describing their protocol, they were describing their rationale. So we already had that, and we've had that for probably a half a year or longer. Um, so I, don't, I, I think it would be unreasonable to delay the actual process of evaluation any further. Uh, if you want the commissioners to look at this with some guidance, that's fine. But, but please, I mean, we've had all those documents which in great detail describe what their protocols and procedures and the reasons that they chose those protocols and procedures. I think just one thing we should look at, and it's a very good point that you did present what they were doing six months ago, but I think we need to look at the lessons learned from did they set a parameter that actually 
turned out to be that included too many cases or excluded too many cases. So I, I don't think it will cause any unnecessary delay. The next meeting is in June. I think for June we can actually have that information together, decide which members or people or how we need to involve people to do it. So I would actually agree with Commissioner Green on this one that I think it's really important, especially in these evolutionary processes, to look and see people that tried to invent the wheel as a square before or if they did really well, you know, what we can do better. You know, I think... It's well, I can, Brian, Brian, I can actually answer the question because I am the person who is the point person collaborating with the FBI on the review of the cases. And they have not thought that for a moment that they have been reviewing too many cases. On the contrary, the, the problem that the FBI has is that they decided they were going to review at least 2,100 cases going back to 1985. And what they're trying to do is to figure out a way to get the cases that go back into the early 80s and late 70s. The problem that they're having is, is they, they only have a computer database that goes back to 85, and they don't have the earlier cases. Uh, but they've come up with other ways to get those earlier cases. Uh, they do not for a moment think that they are examining too many cases. In fact, what everyone will see is that in the, in the review that they've been conducting, uh, that the overwhelming majority of examiners and the overwhelming majority of, uh, of uh, transcripts seem to have, uh, uh, you know, these kinds of errors. I think that's eventually, I predict that's what eventually will be, will be very clear to everybody. But for, I can tell you, in no uncertain terms right now, so there's no reason to delay it, that, they, that the FBI does not feel that their inquiry has been too broad. On the contrary, they're simply wrestling with the difficulties in making it broader. All right, I think we've had our update. Um, I've indicated how, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm just, to, for clarification, I'm trying to read these tables, and sure. I know a lot of work goes into putting them together. Mm -hmm. So if I'm reading them correctly, <coughs> to date, you've received one transfer. Correct. All right, so we have no idea what any of them are going to say. But you've already excluded several of the cases from being relevant to the analysis because we now know that the hair evidence was not part of the conviction, right? Correct. Um, and there's one that indicates that DNA was done or, or that, that so the hair was not, the hair comparison was not relevant because DNA was done. There were some plea bargains in here. So we're down to about, what? 10, 15 transcripts that you're waiting on? Uh, I think there's a lot more than that because if you have certain jurisdictions have lots of things well, that you don't, you don't know anything about yet. You don't right. even know if they're going to find anything. Right, but I think your point is germane that I'm not sure we need to rush to make a decision now because we don't have the product we to review. We don't have anything to review yet. Yeah, I think that's a salient point. And we really don't know how quickly you're going to get them, right? Well, yeah. the, the people are definitely responding and being responsive to it. Uh, I just think waiting till June is not going to be kicking the can down the road because we have nothing for anyone to look at. That was my point. We've right. got plenty of time to <coughs> look into what the criteria are because there's nothing to look at yet. Well, be before, uh, I think you're not analyzing this uh, uh, exactly right in, in this respect. Uh, I think what Mike started off by saying is we should look at the transcripts uh, and the reports and see if there was any problems in terms of uh, testimony being put before juries that uh, it went beyond mm -hmm. the limits of science. And so even in a case where, uh, for whatever reason, uh, ultimately one knows, or even at the beginning one knows, that uh, the hair is not going to be material to the outcome, or in a case uh, uh, as Dr. Corrado was uh, focusing on, where there was eventually DNA analysis done on the hair. At the very beginning of this process, it's important to know whether the hair analysts were testifying improperly, even if it wasn't material, even if there was a subsequent DNA test, particularly one that, you know, perhaps didn't even corroborate their testimony. The point is, uh, as, you know, uh, uh, is known from the FBI's own review, if you begin to see that the analysts were consistently testifying improperly, and I think that this was Mike's point, or they were always testifying properly, you know, and then you get a baseline sense of what you're dealing with. Uh, but uh, certainly it's fair to say that at this point the Bureau understands that uh, 
they're dealing with a problem in terms of some pretty consistent uh, testimony beyond the limits of science. And so that's what we have to find out. And the sooner we get transcripts, the better. So just another clarification, you make a note, not applicable, no hair at trial. Mm -hmm. It isn't that the analyst testified improperly. It's that there's no, the hair was not introduced. The analyst did not testify. So there's going to be nothing to look at on true. that case. Okay, just to be That's clear true. about what that note meant. Okay. That's that. All right, we will continue through RFS to um, gather all the information, including transcripts where cases went to trial and people testified with regard to the hair, and this will be on at our next meeting for an update. The only thing I would add, uh, Michael, is that um, I, I wasn't here. I heard that Brian is going to coordinate with the DAs to try and secure transcripts. Is that right? We're in the process. They're already doing that, and they'll continue to do it. All I, all I want to remind you of is we also have an offer from the Attorney General's office that uh, there are some cases where they may be able to get transcripts as well. And, and, and I think I hooked Brian up with the, uh, uh, the attorney there who made the offer, and, and, and you should follow up with her, that's all. If we run into a roadblock with the DAs where there's a transcript that exists and we can't get it and we think they can be helpful, we'll certainly do that. Okay. All right, the next item we have on the agenda under all business is um, an update with regard to accreditation providers. Um, this is an issue that's been on um, many of our meeting agendas over the last several years um, relating to whether or not we continue to use um, ASCLAD Lab and ABFT, um, whether we expand the universe of people we use, whether we go to something else. Um, and at one of our prior meetings, the request was made of um, OFS to look at the different accreditation providers out there and give us some comparison um, of who's out there in this field and what they're doing. Um, so Brian and his staff um, spent considerable time um, trying to put together an initial comparison for us. I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Sure. So there's two documents that all the commission members have. The first is uh, kind of what we call an executive summary to the comparison chart. That's the first document. And then the second document is a uh, legal size black document. That's the actual comparison chart. And you know, clearly this is a challenging uh, way to synthesize a tremendous amount of information into a easily understandable area. And I hope we have achieved it. So the executive summary is just six pages, really simplified down from literally hundreds of pages of final ideas. But also what I wanted to be very cognizant of is that OFS is not making any decisions or determinations, nor am I. What I'm trying to do is just point out some basic history, some basic facts. And what happened is the comparison chart is uh, the 17025 standards, which we discussed at the last meeting, and the comparison of the different providers, the three ISO providers, and the and ABFT, so ASCAD Lab and ABFT are the current providers of accreditation for New York State Labs. And there's two others that we agreed at the last meeting should be included. So the comparison chart, what it does is on the far left of the comparison chart, if you turn it open, has the uh, ISO standard. Then to the right, there's HULA, which is one of the providers, ABFT, ANAB, and ASCLAD Lab. So under each of the columns that go up and down, what you'll find is there's a color code. If the color is like that bluish gray, that means that the provider meets the ISO 17025 standard. If it's yellow, it means potentially the provider partially meets it. And if it's red, it means it doesn't meet it. And then what happens is if there's writing within the document, within the cells of that, what it means is in addition to the ISO standard, which is on the far left, that specific accreditation provider or accreditation by, uh, uh, AB as it's known, We'll have another uh, stand, another requirement, a, a supplemental requirement that's listed there. So if you see writing there, uh, that's a, another section that that particular accreditation provider has. If it's italicized, that means it's actually something that's a note, and notes don't have to be followed. If it's actually just written um, in regular type, that means it's a requirement. For the ones, what we try to also do, because some of these things are rather lengthy, 
If you see it in quotes, that means it's verbatim from what the standard is or the requirement is. If it's not in quotes, that we tried to paraphrase it so we didn't have this document go on for pages and pages. But I just want to point out that sometimes you'll see either a standard or a supplemental requirement that's not in quotes. That means we tried to paraphrase a much larger requirement. So what this does is it allows you to look at all of these providers and how they compare against the ISO 17025 standard, which is what we discussed at the last meeting. Um, the actual, you know, I guess if you look at it on crude levels, don't necessarily just look at how much text is written in boxes to say that one particular accreditation provider is actually better than another, but actually look at what those words say and how much substance they have or how much value they'll actually add to what that standard is. Now, uh, on many occasions, it was hard uh, to judge some of the ABFT stuff because at the same time of not necessarily meeting the 17025 standard, they actually exceed it in other ways because they're very technically specific. So I tried to also capture that as much as possible and list those things. So they go into much more technical detail than the, uh, than the ISO standards would for a specific uh, provider. So it, there's a lot of information. I thought maybe the best way to move forward would be if you look at the um, executive summary document and if can you I, can I just ahead. ask you a question sure. before you go on? And like if you take the first page, for example, um, or the second page, so on the first page, the last um, would be looking across. The, the bottom thing on the left is blank. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? So essentially what it means is if you look at the far right under ASCLAD Lab, in addition to having a 4.1.4.1, they have another standard under that. So to try and not mix it, those are all supplementals that re go back to stand the ISO standard of 4.14. So 4.141 and 4. Point right under it. So there's a space left because this particular supplemental is qualifying that standard that's on the far left. Does and that then make the sense? fact that the boxes are blue under A2LA and ANAB indicates that they have the same extra supplemental as as clad lab no. no that's actually a good point what it means is that they have the same as 4.14 but they don't have that additional part uh, does that make sense yep so just again to, so it would appear that a2la and anab are simply reiterating the iso standards as their standards correct there's nothing different in their standards, there's nothing supplemental that you would have put in these boxes. For those particular standards, there are in other areas. And, and elsewhere. Yeah. But so somewhere A2LA says, well, they say this, the management system shall meet ISO standards. Exactly. And by saying that, the presumption is that all of those standards are being met by any lab accredited by A2LA. Right. And it's possible also that if you see nothing written in a box, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Sometimes the ISO standard is so robust that it meets it. So if you look at like 4.1.3 across the board, no one has anything that's a supplemental to that because they all feel what the ISO standard is meets the requirement. Now, to also be clear, on the other hand, A2LA, ANAB, and ASSAT Lab are <coughs> ISO accredited accrediting organizations, correct? Correct. So whatever was missing in their standards, they have been told by the ISO accrediting of accrediting <laughs> organizations, you need to fix this, and they fixed it. I'm not sure that anything was missing, oh, but your analogy maybe, maybe is correct. Maybe nothing was missing, but they did this crosswalk in the process of applying for ISO recognition. Right. right. Now, on the other hand, ABFT is not an ISO recognized accrediting organization. So they have not done, presumably, this crosswalk, nor have they benefited from the review of the ISO organization saying, we've looked, you're missing, you might want to fix. Would it not be valuable at this point to ask ABFT to take phenomenal amount of work. Thank you so much. I don't know how many hours you must have spent. It must have been 
you know, I can imagine the, the whiteboards that had to put all this together. Um, remarkable effort, okay? But I think ABFT needs to be asked, these things that are red, are they red? Or is, would they say there's some general standard somewhere? Or was it not their intent to meet an ISO standard? And if not, why not? Because we've biased, I'm not, not in a bad way, but right. the, the review is biased because three of the four are right. ISO recognized and one of them is not. And I think they kind of need to be given the opportunity to tell us where they think maybe they are or they're less far away <coughs> or to highlight the things that are really in excess. You know, some of these yellow things, are they mm -hmm. really even more than? So it's just. You make a very valid point. It's actually a good segue into maybe a little history, which is in the beginning part of the executive summary. I think what happened is when historically, when ASCLAD Lab and ABFT were chosen in New York State as the accreditation providers, they were both what are known as freestanding accrediting bodies. So what that essentially meant is they were not externally recognized by anyone. So that's the same thing for ASCLAD Lab. Uh, this is very common under uh, discipline-specific accreditation programs, and also there was not an external ISO standard for them to go to until 1999. So we started earlier than that. We started in 1997. So at the time, both ABFT and ASCAD Lab did not have an entity that they could go for to do it with. So after 17025 standard came out in 1999, uh, the next step of the evolution of any accrediting body is usually to seek a broader recognition. So the way this process works normally is that the accrediting body, the freestanding accreditation body will find an international standard. Since 1999, they had 17025. More recently, for toxicology, one of the options they had was 15189. But they will adopt an international standard. They will then modify their program, show compliance with it, and then they'll apply for something called ISO 17011 accreditation. That will allow them to go to the next level, which is the regional cooperation. The regional cooperation will then monitor them, and then they can move to the next level above that and apply for a full international. And the whole idea behind this is not necessarily forensic science or lab testing. It has to do with international trade. So the idea is that you can be recognized for providing at least a base level product across the board. So you're exactly right, but I don't think it's necessarily a ding to the ABFT program. They've been evolving, and actually in putting this together, we've reached out to Graham Jones and Bruce Goldberger, both from ABFT, and they've both hinted, and, and we've had discussions with them for a while that they are looking for an ISO partner. And I think at this point, I'm, I, I know I don't want to you know, tip anything that they've talked to me about, but they are looking to move in an ISO direction. You know, personally, from my perspective, I have absolutely no problem providing this to them and see if there's something that they feel is left out. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that um, they don't need the information on the other three. All they need is what you no, did on the on their, ISO no. and on theirs. And then your point is just to ask them if they have any feedback they want to give us on these. Yeah. I don't because, see how that hurts. I mean, ABFT has gone also in other routes of recognition um, as clinical lab accrediting organization for other purposes, mm -hmm. clinical labs. So this trade purpose was not their highest priority. And I just right. think they should be asked, you know, we did this, could you fill in the holes? Right, and, and again, you're, it's, it's a challenging thing to do. Oh. So we use the 17025 standard as the base, just from our discussions at the last meeting. But you're right, it's a bit of an unplaying, unfair playing field because they're not a 17025 uh, body. Yeah, and I don't, none of it is criticism of what was done. It's just oh, it's saying gives them a chance to get us more information. It's not a criticism of them. Right. It's just opportunity to give us more information. Kathy, you had... uh, the only thing I wanted to point out um, was with the question that um, you were asking is that if, if the organization is recognized and is using the ISO 17025, it's not necessarily that they have other things that have to meet that. They actually have to meet that. <laughs> so that is one of their standards, that 17025 is a standard, and then they can have supplemental. Right. And that's what's written in there. So and I just want to make why sure. why ABFT is getting these red boxes, because they're not saying that, because they're not. Because they're not, right. And, and what I would re recommend you do is when you see something with a red box, just look to the left and see what that what standard is. is. 
I mean, I can't believe that an ABFT lab isn't going to be a legally responsible entity. But they don't say you must meet ISO standard XXX and be illegally, you know. Right. Somewhere they say something that says you're legally responsible for what you do. But also when we look that's at it. Go ahead. Marina, go ahead no, I was just Marina. going to say that first question. There is in the ABFT checklist, there is a question how are legal complaints resolved. It doesn't say, or you have to explain how do you resolve any legal complaints. I, I think what it really is, is it's something in the evolution of the AB, in this particular case ABFT, and it's not necessarily a thing against them. Uh, it's just that the standard itself doesn't explicitly say it, and we have to be very literal about this because we're trying to make our determination as objective and not subjective as possible. So essentially, if it's explicitly written in a document, and this overall, this comparison does not also take in the program requirements or anything else, like uncertainty is not even considered in here, which is another huge vestige of something we need to look at. But when it comes to it, we're looking at, the, as Marina said, the checklist. What would someone go to that lab and look at and check off and say, yes, they have to have this? And right now, this is just where it stands. But also, this is a first step if we want to decide where we want to go and how we want to you know, increase the standards within New York. I just think ABFT needs to be given the opportunity sure. to say where in the checklist does it deal with these items, period. Yeah, I have no disagreement with that at all. I have, I have one informational question. Uh, I recall that uh, uh, I, got, I got this question from a, uh, a vendor uh, outside of New York State. Um, and he was asking me if he'd been accredited by one of uh, the ISO entities, I guess, uh, ANAB or A2LA. You know, yeah, A2LA, uh, but not ASCLAD. Uh, would uh, that person be essentially licensed or approved to practice in New York? Have we ever said anything about that? In other words, I think we've... Uh, right what, now, what is, what is that? if you are a, um, what's the standard, a public forensic lab, you have to be accredited by the commission, and I think by our rules, that accreditation has to be as clad lab, or if you are a um, tox lab, right. then ABFT. So the, the short answer would be, if they're a public forensic lab, then no, it wouldn't be recognized right now under our rules. Well, and I think that's the question that's been put on the table um, yeah. you know, different forms at other meetings is do we want to continue on that route? Do we want to change or do we want to open it up to more than one? No, I, I understand that point, but my, my question, and Ann probably knows this, is uh, uh, you're a private vendor outside of New York. Uh, actually, let's take a discipline like fingerprints, right, which I don't know if we even have you know, we have jurisdiction for the crime labs that do fingerprints, but not over the police agencies that uh, are not crime labs. Uh, so we don't have jurisdiction uh, over such the an profit. entity. We don't have jurisdiction over the profit vendors either. If you're right. a, if you're in a privately owned for-profit lab who wants to come to New York and do work and testify, as I understand it, our rules don't apply to you. Yeah, I, that's, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. But yeah. by saying the rules don't apply, they're also then not accredited by this commission. And to the extent that the courts would only accept evidence from accredited labs, they're not an accredited lab. So, no, they're not licensed. I think more than likely you'd probably end up getting cross-examined on the fact yeah, that you weren't accredited rather than right. not being allowed to present it. Mm -hmm. Beyond the scope of this commission also, and, and Anne might be able to speak to this more, is that the Department of Health also recognizes certain things in, I believe, DNA testing, right? And, yeah. and tox testing for you to do work outside of New York State if you're a private vendor. The forensic tox lab, not, not exempted from Department of Health by virtue of being owned by a county for purposes of forensics, would have to meet DOH class license requirements. Mm -hmm and 
the same for forensic DNA labs that are not exempt by nature of their government ownership. They have to meet New York State DOH CLEP requirements. Are those labs that operate in New York State or labs that operate anywhere that want to come to New York State Either. and present their Either. results? Yeah. So you can be in California and have a DOH permit to do testing on New York State samples. You can also be in New York and have one of those permits. So if you're in Selmark or if you're some private lab, you, before you can come here and testify, you need a DOH. Correct. All right. When Even before you can do the testing. When New York State Police Lab contracted with Myriad Genetics for the DNA testing of the database samples, that lab had to get a New York State Department of Health CLEP permit in order to become a contract lab. But that only applies for DNA and toxicology, not for the other right. disciplines, because those are the only two accredited. that DOH oversees. Right. right. Yeah, but I guess what I'm thinking about is that, you know, one way that we can get some assurance that private laboratories that come in to testify in New York uh, <coughs> have at least uh, their minimum standards is to Stip, you know, is, is to create some kind of uh, uh, procedure where they have to demonstrate that if they meet, you know, ISO 17025, they and they're accredited by such an agency, then uh, they can be presumptively and temporarily accredited by uh, the commission. I don't think we have the statutory authority to do that. I think our statutory authority is limited to the labs that we deal with right now. Public forensic mm -hmm. labs. Yeah. Yeah. And that's clearly written in the and, and the reason that the Department of Health has that additional requirement is that that's uh, a statutory, statutory requirement, right? Well, it's statutory. Now, that may be something that we should think about changing. It's actually a case law requirement. Yeah. Any... Yeah, I know it's a lot of information that we've dropped on people here. Um, you know, first I want to echo uh, Ann's comments. Or Brian, I think you and uh, the people in your unit did a great job putting this together. It was a lot of work. Now, the question is now, what do we do with this? Um, you know, do people feel like they need time to digest this? Um, you know, what, what are our next steps now that we have this comparison? So one of the things mentioned in the summary that I think is particularly important is not only what standards do they go by, but do they have adequate resources that they send enough people to a lab to do an audit that they can actually look carefully at everything? And then do they have the appropriate staff to review things? Is there impartiality of the people who are doing the auditing? It'd be nice to have a little bit more information on that because um, so for the Department of Health, when we've gone into DNA labs and done audits, it's very clear that sometimes the audit that's been done prior to you has been very thorough. <coughs> Other times it's pretty obvious that it wasn't. So they spot checked things and didn't go through. And, and I'm sure it wasn't uh, intentional. I'm sure it was just that they only had a certain amount of time. So they picked certain things they wanted to look at but they didn't look at everything. So especially when presumably these organizations are going to be doing some sort of a, if we allow more organizations to do this, then the economics of it will come into effect and they'll be trying to be the low bidder. So we certainly don't want a race to the bottom in terms of the quality of the organization that we're going to use. Did you try and collect any of that information? What I wanted to do at this point is I was trying to be very cautious not to inject my own uh, mm -hmm. responses or biases to it. So what I did is I outlined things that were concerns to me. Uh, if the commission agrees with those, we can clearly evaluate them based on those. So my thought at this point was maybe not to add an extra step, but even if you look at, you know, what we dictated down as the major components of a forensic accreditation program that translate to increased quality, if we could look through that and if anyone had any comments or concerns, if you feel that these are accurate and that they are what we want to look at, as a next step, we can actually evaluate these further based on that. 
Uh, and also, you know, we can start looking a little deeper regarding the other things that we talked about, and that's the next section of that executive summary, which is other factors that influence the quality of a forensic accreditation program. And it's kind of something that I call the intangibles. So there's tangibles, which are the heart of clearly it's a standard, there's a requirement, but there's the intangibles, like what does the support staff and structure look like? Is there one person for a thousand labs, or is there adequate staff and resources to do what they need to do? Right. You know, are things written clearly and cohesively so someone can actually look on a checklist and find them, or does it reference you to 37 different books, which essentially means no one's ever going to look. Someone's going to check it off and say, yeah, they have it, or no, they don't, because it's not, it's not easy enough to go look and say, well, refer to this, refer to this, refer to this. If you're on site, you'd never find that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess what I wanted to do is do it more slowly and deliberately because it is, you know, a fairly large task. And, and if you have to, can take a moment, or if you want me to go through them, I'd be willing to, or people have already looked and think it's okay. You know, if you look at, on the executive summary, looking at page four, what major components of a forensic accreditation program translate to increase quality, you know, if you're in agreement with what those components are, OFS can then take more information and we can also give an additional document that says where these programs fit according to that. And uh, as far as the intangibles, as best we can, you know, we can try and talk and find that out. I guess maybe I'm missing something here, but I, the, what you've listed starting on page four, are, are you saying these are components that the accreditation program should have, or these are things that an accreditation program should look at with regard to what's happening in the lab? Essentially, this is independent of the ISO 17025 process. This is looking at many different resources, like Taylor's Quality Assurance book that was written from NIST and other sources uh, historically, like many, many sources. This is something that my group came together and we kind of brainstormed and said, you know, these are the things that we're looking at. These are the things we feel are important. But let me stop. Like number three, sure. you say that a laboratory, for a lab to be doing quality work, the examiners need to be sufficiently trained. And I assume you're talking about the laboratory examiners who are doing the casework. Correct. Right? I, if I'm getting Ann's point, what Ann is saying is that with regard to the accreditation program, she would like more information about the people who work for the, you know, what are the resources of the accreditation program? How many people do they have working for them? Mm -hmm. You know, how thorough are their inspections? What? How, how do they decide how many auditors to send them? and how long to send them for to a particular lab on an audit, for example. So I, I guess, did we look at, when we're looking at these programs, are we just doing a paper look at first to say what standards do they use, or did we also look at issues in terms of, practically speaking, you know, how do they do their inspections? You know, do we have any measures we can use to compare and say, you know, are they all equally thorough? Um, you know, does there seem to be equal quality? Does one seem to be more or less thorough than the other? Is there any, you know, did we try and look at that? We're not at that stage yet. No. What, what happens is the first stage of the game is first to look at the standards and the requirements. Uh, that's another part down the way because if you don't have the standards and requirements, it doesn't matter what support staff you have. If I'm correct, these 10 are things that your staff, and I think we would all agree, would be important to be assessed of the accredited labs. And the question is, we don't know yet, because you haven't looked yet, whether each of these four accrediting bodies actually have standards that examine these 10 items. Exactly. So what we're saying is and these are- And that's what he's saying. He needs to look at each of the accrediting organizations to see if they even have standards relevant to these 10 lab issues. Then the issue that we asked about so who are the surveyors that visit the labs and what's their competence and training and background and what are the resources? But that's not even on the list yet. That's this intangible right. next phase. And I apologize, it's layers of the onion and okay. as you no, get deeper no, no, it all makes fine. you cry. But it's one of these things where you have to have it in those different phases yes. to see. And I think it just has to be a slow and deliberate thing because if a provider says we'll send 100 evaluators and we'll spend a year there, but they don't look at any standards, yeah, it, right. it's, it's hard. And again, they're, they're, they're all important, but it's, you have to put it as a phased implementation of looking at, and you're exactly right that they're there, and that's why in this executive summary we spent time to try and find a way to consolidate all these concerns into a very short and, and consinct issue, but also to essentially bring it back to the Commission and see if there's agreement on if these parameters are appropriate to evaluate. And I think 
you know, potentially for the next meeting in June, we could evaluate, you know, one through 10 on these bodies. And what we can also do is try and look as best we can at those intangibles. That's harder to look at because, uh, you know, we can ask historically, I guess, if you look at a lab of this size, how many people did you send? But if it's hard to say who, how many would you send and how do you make that determination? Because there's no way to really support it. The historical data would be better. Would we get any accurate feedback from labs who use these programs or no? At some point, yeah. But I think it could be but challenging. I'm saying, do you think we, even if we asked, do you think we would get accurate feedback? From, if you ask the labs themselves? Yeah, yeah so if we went to labs that are using A2LA and labs that are using... Oh, yeah, they'll tell you. But I, I don't know that they, I mean, I, I don't know that they would, knowing that this is a public meeting, that they want their name saying, yeah, we use this body and uh, we don't think they're any good. Act their identity. And they're I'm coming the, to inspect this. Yeah, <laughs> they're coming to inspect this again, and we say they're One not of the good other they questions good. I think we had asked this was how many labs have each of these entities actually accredited in the forensic disciplines? And I do believe for a couple of them it's a really tiny number. Right, then I have that information now if you want. I, what I did is I waited to get that till today to see if anything changed. But uh, I, I think somewhere in my little mass of papers here I have, but I think. Uh, so as far as uh, ANAV, I think they're at 74. Um, for A2LA, they're at four. And for ASCLAD Lab, um, I'm going to see if I can find the right document. They're about 370 or so. That's a substantial number. I'll try and find the exact number. Um, I guess um, what I would say, Mike, and part of your question is, I, I actually agree with um, what your office put together for these 10 issues. and. Like the few of them that stick out in my mind compared to what we're doing is, you know, the measurement uncertainty. I mean, it's a sort of a requirement in the 17025, but how it's applied is not very clear. So I think that's a, that is something that differentiates different accrediting bodies. And number eight, which was um, testimony review. I, I personally think that's really important. And, you know, I'm not sure. That's not at all in 17025 because 17025 is about laboratory work. It's not about people testifying. So these are, to me, the, the issues that were identified are things that might be covered in the 17025, but there are additional things that a forensic laboratory probably should be doing. And I think we need to ask the question, are all of these different agencies doing these things? So this is almost like a supplemental, an additional group of things that are important that we should do a comparison of, um, in addition to what, you know, what Ann brought up, what you all talked about, about what the accrediting bodies can and can't do. But I think as the next step, it would be a good idea to get information comparing them on these 10 issues as well as the intangibles, if that's what they're calling them. Yeah, and I think also this is something that will be a little fair to APFT because you're not holding them to an abstract standard that they weren't trying to compete with. You're actually saying that these general quality concepts, where you fit within them. And actually, I just found those numbers. So ASCAD Lab is 397 labs. Uh, ANAB is 74 labs and A2LA is four. And I can, I can send that out as well, but I waited to just look before this meeting in case there was a dramatic change up or down. Uh, so I can try and give you as much. It really raises questions about A2LA's experience, not necessarily their intent or their ability, but what about ABFT? Uh, I, 34. I 34? Okay, so it's, it's 34. Oh. Sorry, I didn't look that way. That's well. 36, but approximately 35. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jean, can I make one comment? Sure. Um, in considering the number of labs accredited, you also have to consider how many labs are there out there. So I think there are far fewer forensic toxicology laboratories than crime laboratories, so you don't expect ABFT to have accredited anywhere near the volume that ASCLED Lab is, for example. You have to keep that in, in perspective. <laughs> So I, I guess the, the thought process here was I didn't think that this would be something we could resolve in 15 minutes. What I wanted to try and do is that we literally looked through thousands of pages of highly complicated, highly technical documents and trying to distill it down. So in that path, I wanted to see if we could have agreement on those 10 concepts and as much as we can, the intangibles. And if you were in agreement, what we would do is we would continue this task and continue to look at those, uh, those concepts. And we, I'm more than willing to discuss and uh, go into those further if you'd like. 
but we've continued to look at and vet those providers, all, all of those providers based on that. And I think it's just a little bit more specific. Uh, and, and we can see, and also I have no problem at all you know, provide, sharing this with any of the providers as well, and because we're looking, we've been working with them extensively to try and get this, and they've been very cooperative. So I, I do appreciate their help. It's not something that we're doing in a vacuum. You know, as you can see from the executive summary, there's been a lot of communications with all the ABs, uh, as well as their open public documents that are on there and things that they've provided us. So if we're in contact with the providers anyways, is it possible to just ask them, do they have a formula for deciding how many auditors to send? I mean, they must have some decision-making process. Right. Um, I, I would have no problem doing that. The only thing I would say is I would also like some historical data where if we look at, if I can identify a lab that's accredited under their program that has a certain size and scope, how many did you send there? Mm -hmm. Because, again, what I'm trying to do is not to belittle them. I think they've all been very good, but they are vendors. Mm -hmm. So vendors are going to try and sell products. So I just want to have something. We'll say, how many would you have? And then let's look historic to see how many did you provide in a similar situation historically. And if it changed for some reason, why did you do it? Just so we could, you know, as, as try and keep it as objective as possible. Yes, the other question I have is at some point during this process, do we seek um, input beyond Kathy's input here at the meeting from lab directors? I certainly think that's a good idea. We can bring it to NICLAC. I can bring it to NICLAC and get input. I, at this point, I don't know what that input is, but when if something we want to address it, I think it's really important would be to hear from the lab directors. Yes, thank you. And at what point do we do that? I think, well, I mean, I, I don't know, is it, would it be possible for these documents to be made available to NICLAC? Is there an issue with that? I don't as believe so. As far as I'm concerned, no. I mean, I think it would help all of the labs to be able to have this information, to be able to see the comparisons um, and see the executive summary. And maybe um, we have a meeting in June. I can bring it up and see if they have any additional input as to the, the 10 items that were identified, um, maybe other things that we think might be important. Yeah, that, so I, I guess I think that would be important if you could get us feedback for sure. our next meeting yeah. from the lab directors. And the first week in June is the, is the NICLAC meeting, and I have no problem. We can provide this to the lab directors, you know, this week, so they have time to consider it in advance of that meeting. Does NICLAC include the TOX labs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, you know, at this point, you know, we have no horse in the race. I think the more information we get, the better. I just want to make sure whatever information we get has a way to be independently verified through other sources along the way. You know, so we can go and, as I said, try and keep it as objective as possible. And then we can decide at the end of this what path we want to take and where we want to go. You know, one of the things you can see, and it, it, it came, like, when you look initially just at this comparison chart, um, one of the things that... ASCAD Lab, one of our providers that we use now, is strong and is the management control. So in addition to the ISO standards under the Section 4, they have a lot of supplementals that are meaningful supplementals, not just words, under the Section 4 to talk about training, to talk about ethics training, to talk about mandatory, you know, pe people have to get training in the guiding principles, uh, distinct qualifications of lab director, or, th you know, things like that. So, and ABFT has some of those things as well. But when we look at it, those, those management controls are a carryover a lot from their legacy program as well as uh, later in the technical parts. But since, since the evolution of, AB, of ASCLED Lab over some of the other ones was coming from this legacy freestanding program, they have a lot of the, the stuff that they brought. So it's, I don't think we're in bad shape with either one right now, with ABFT or ASCLED Lab, with what we have. So the good news is just from looking at this, you know, they both have some value they bring. The question is, can we increase the value that everyone brings to the table and where we need to go with these other providers. So as I understand what we've discussed for next steps, you're indicating that you're going to take the 10 principles or areas that you've identified and for our next meeting compare those against the different accrediting bodies and tell us you know, to what extent they address those areas and to what extent they don't? Correct. As best we can. All right. Kathy, you're going to get feedback for us from the lab directors? Yes. Are we going to do anything to address or try and address Ann's point in terms of getting any information on how robust um, the different accrediting bodies are in terms of actually doing their work and their inspections, or is that down the line? 
I think what we can do is at the same time that we're looking at those 10 factors, and again, if there's agreement from the commission, the other, other parts that we identified as other factors that influence the quality of the forensic accreditation program, we'll try our best to do what we can to do it. And again, we'll open source, show our work, so you can see how we got there. So if for some reason there's a conclusion that's incorrect, you can see, well, you didn't get it from here, you didn't get it from there. You know, we're just the conduit to get there. You know, so we'll try and show our work as much as possible and, and explain how we got to that path so that way there could be a more informed, deliberate process. Anything else, in, either in terms of comment or in terms of next steps or information that people think we need? Marina? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, I believe you suggested it and, and Willie touched on it. Are you going to share just this ABFT part with ABFT? Because it, by looking at it, I think there are some of the some of the questions uh, I feel should have been answered differently. That they are actually there. Yes, we will share the column on the left and the ABFT column with ABFT right. and ask them for their feedback. I think it might also be appropriate to share it with all the providers, so that everyone has an equal chance yeah. to kind of look at it and say this is where it is. Just share. Their, their own column right. with each provider. Don't right. share them. Okay. Right. This is this is what we'll do is we'll limit it to this is the ISO standard. This is what we interpret as your supplemental. And if they see there's other things that they want to put in there, by all means. Fair you enough. Know, yeah. I have no problem with that. All right. When when you send this to NICLAC, then please make sure it's sent with a instruction that it's not to be shared. Then. I'm going to send it to you and let you. Do it. I can do that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else on this topic? And I assume that this will be on our agenda for the next meeting as well. Yes, it will. All right. Well, job security. <laughs> Unless I've missed anything, I think that brings us to new business. Um, the first thing we have under new business are the annual lab summaries. Um, Brian? Yeah, this is just something historically we always see at this time of year. You know, this is the summary of the correspondence from the different laboratories. Uh, Again, we just get this summary every year. So if there's any questions about that. All right, the next item is our open meeting, um, our website posting. At our last meeting, uh, Marvin raised an issue about uh, materials from the meeting and distribution of materials and what was on the website. Um, in the materials that were circulated to all the commission members, there's a memo um, that addresses this issue. Um, I, I think the memo pretty much speaks for itself. Um, you know, so if there's any questions, feel free to raise them. But again, otherwise, I think the memo addresses the issue that was raised. Well, I, I'm a little confused by this. Are, are you actually saying, uh, Gina, that uh, the only documents that become public uh, in our binders, right, which are not executive session documents, are the ones that are specifically mentioned at the meeting? Well, no. The documents in your binders shouldn't be disseminated by you. Whatever's on the website can be disseminated. So if you want to go to the website and get a document that may be in the binder, because there may be redactions that were made from the document that's in the binder to the website that may be slight that you may not see. So anything, that's why everything in the binder is stamped with a confidential stamp. So if you got it from your binder, you got it as a commission member, and you shouldn't be disseminating it. You are free to go to the website and get anything that is in the binder that may be on the website. And then that. So it, just, just so I understand this, because I don't, because the way I was reading this, it seemed as though uh, uh, one had to mention every document that was not an executive session document at the meeting in order for it to be posted on the website. But what you're telling me, in, in, in plain English, is that every document that we get in our binders that are not an executive session document uh, are going up on the website with redactions in them that uh, you are making to protect privacy no. or uh, for some particular reason? Is that what you're no, telling me? that's not what I said. So there may be documents that are identical that are in your binder 
that are also on the website. However, you got the ones in your binder as a commission member. So there's language in the public officer's <coughs> law that says you shouldn't use the documents that you get as a member. So you're not, you're not disclosing confidential information acquired in the course of your official duties and use it to further your own personal interests. So you can certainly go to the website and download whatever's there and print it off and disseminate it. But whatever's in your binder was given to you as a commission member and you shouldn't pass that on. Right, but when you, when you talk about personal interests, I, I assure you uh, that uh, uh, my interests here are just making sure that there's disclosure of information subject to protecting privacy considerations or something that the commission as a whole or appropriately designates. That's uh, true. That's one. And, so I uh, mentioned the, the first exemption. There's another one that says you shouldn't attempt to use your official position to secure unwanted privileges or exemptions for yourself or others. So that's the same thing. So any member of the public would have to go to the website in order to get this information. So if you want to pass it on, then that's where you need to go also. I, I, I'm asking you something different because I don't want okay. to, uh, I guess I will if I have to, but it, it doesn't seem to me to, uh, uh, should we be going to the website uh, in terms of looking at the documents and then comparing them to what's in our binders, right, in order to understand what you've redacted? I mean, can sure you give me a policy redaction? I guess I'm kind of starting from the assumption that, you know, Your these lab reports and these things that we're talking about, you can't understand what we're talking about at a meeting unless you're actually looking at the documents in question. So okay. I start from the presumption that everything that I have in my binder that is not officially designated uh, as executive session <laughs> is something that should be on the website subject to you going through them, because we get a lot of these at the last minute, I appreciate that, subject to you going through them and making, you know, redactions of names or, you know, uh, 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 other privacy things. I mean, what am I going to find if I start comparing our binders to the website? There may be information that's in your binder that's not foilable or able to be published on the website. So you won't find, you know, I guess you can do a comparison every, I'm not sure why it would be necessary because you have everything in your binder that's not redacted, executive session and open session. So there may be things that may go up on the website, but there may be names redacted, for instance, that you have in your binder. For example, Barry, this document, our analysis of the, is not on the website is not going to be on the website, is not publicly disclosable. This comparison... Why wouldn't this document... Why wouldn't this document that we've just discussed for close to an hour, comparing all the different accrediting agencies and their provisions, which presumably are publicly uh, 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 obtainable positions, why wouldn't that work product that we're thinking about and debating, uh, think, why wouldn't that be on the website? I don't think all of their supplemental standards are publicly available. Brian can speak to that. And um, it, it may be not. foilable, but that would be a separate FOIL request made to the commission to ask for a copy and a decision made by their records access officer. It's not for us to decide. It's not for... Brian to decide, it's for the records access officer to decide. And just, and to, just to speak to that, I'm sorry to cut you off. You know, you've got a copious amount of information that I apologize for dumping very late in the game because we took every possible second to work on it. You know, we essentially had less than three months to get this entire project done. So there's a deadline to get that information to you. So the day you got these things in the mail, uh, we finished this two days before you know, for the postage, and there's not really a comprehensive time to do a FOIL review of the, you know, the document that you're looking at now and your eyes are spinning because it's huge. These are not on the website either, are they? The summary of activity of each lab? Just the, the short answer, Barry, is, is commission members, we are endeavoring to provide all of you with every piece of information we have that we think is relevant to your decision as commission members regardless of whether or not it's foilable, 
um, regardless of whether or not there are other issues um, with regard to making it public, because we think it's important as a commission member to make your decisions as commission members. You have that in front of you. There's a completely separate set of rules we have to follow in terms of what we're allowed to make public, and that governs what goes up on the website. And I think all Gina is indicating and all the memo indicates is you shouldn't be giving things out publicly that are in your binder. If you want to give things out publicly, go to the website. And if it's on the website, then you know that someone has looked at it, said, yes, this is public under FOIL, and you can give it out. I, I I'm, I understand that. We get a lot of things at the last minute. I appreciate that we want to get all the information that we can so that we can discuss them at the meetings. What I'm concerned about, uh, and, uh, you know, is not specifically, you know, that, that, that I want a better understanding of it for purposes of this memo, is how the decision making is made with respect to what is going to be going up on the website and what isn't. You know, so I'm not. Uh, uh, criticizing anybody for not having the uh, this huge, uh, uh, you know, I guess Excel spreadsheet about laboratory accreditation programs up on the website, you know, before the meeting because we got it at the last minute and you put it together and it's a lot of work and that happens with a lot of documents we get here and I understand that and it's going to be my, you know, I, I think we should just have a clear understanding that sometime that this kind of document will go up so that anybody can look at it and understand what we were just talking about for an hour uh, and uh, uh, you know should go up as soon as you know possible in terms of you know person power and what you can do uh, and if uh, 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 got to get a better idea of exactly what you are going to be redacting or not uh, that's all and uh, I think that would help. All right, anything else? All right, the last so, issue. In short, I don't think the memo speaks for itself. Anything else? All right, the last issue under late under old business um, is the latent print interoperability. Uh, Peter, I think you raised this at our last meeting. Um, you did send around, um, I believe, a memo on this. I just think it would help me if you could give us um, just a brief um, synopsis of what it is you're looking for here. When, you know, when you refer to latent print interoperability, specifically with regard to the commission work in New York and how it applies to forensic labs and the fingerprint work that they do in New York, what is it that you're looking for? Sure. Um, <clears throat> So what, as a member of the uh, National Commission on Forensic Science, we were alerted to the fact that um, most of the states in the United States do not have interoperability as it's defined by the federal government with other states' fingerprint databases. And in the report I believe that you have, it actually includes New York as an example of one of the states that has difficulty, for instance, um, getting access to fingerprints from the databases immediately adjacent to New York. And so the federal government is, has made a priority in, in making sure that all the states and the federal government become completely interoperable within the next few years. Um, to that end, we thought the commission should find out, one, how does New York State, I guess it would be the New York State Police probably runs the APHIS system, um, how, do, how do they measure their own interoperability uh, right now? Two, uh, are they contemplating acquiring uh, new equipment to update their capacity and if so, will the new equipment that they anticipate acquiring make it more interoperable, or will it continue to have the same interoperability uh, problems uh, that it historically had? Because um, there was no disagreement in the commission, and I can't imagine there'd be any disagreement here among commission members, 
that obviously for a public safety matter, you want to make sure that New York's um, uh, AFA system uh, is is as interoperable interoperable as is possible. Everybody wants that. So uh, I was hoping that what we could get, if not at this meeting, since people are seeing the report now for the first time in the binder, people could read that report. And then at the next meeting, you would have somebody come in to make a presentation uh, who runs the state AFA system who could um, answer some of those questions. What we could do is we could take it upon ourselves to read the report in the next few weeks and then write to you or Brian uh, with specific questions we might have on whoever the point person is in New York who's going to present at the next meeting so that person would have some advanced knowledge of what concerns us. But that's the big picture. I guess um, if I understand what you're raising, and I'm sure if I misspeak, someone around the table or in the uh, audience here will correct me, but as it applies to our work on the commission, if you have someone in an accredited lab doing fingerprint comparison that's looking at a latent and wants to run that through the state database and wants to compare it to other states, they run that through our SABIS system. That SABIS system compares it to every latent print in New York and then also sends it to the FBI. So our system is completely interoperable with the FBI. And my understanding is that in that FBI database are the fingerprints that every other state in the country has sent up to the FBI. So, in fact, it gets run against the fingerprints not only from everybody in New York, but from everybody in the FBI database, which should be all of the fingerprints across, across the country. So yes. you know, you're describing interoperability right now. Um, I, I guess I'm not seeing how we don't have that currently in the system. I, I, I'm not qualified, okay, because I'm not an expert in interoperability, but interoperability is being defined by the um, Office of Science and Technology Policy of the executive branch in a report that's coming out, uh, I think, this week or next week. There's also a, um, a document uh, recommending complete interoperability, which will be posted on the Department of Justice's website uh, sometime by the end of this week as well. And I believe, although I'm not in a position to say it uh, with certainty, that what you describe as interoperability is not complete interoperability. What, that, what are we um, missing? What are we missing? I, just told, I told you I'm not qualified to answer that. I'd be happy, I would be happy to speak to other people in Washington uh, before the next meeting. Um, but what I would think you would want to do is at least have somebody ready to go who could make a presentation to us. It could be five or ten minutes long. Um, it can be done by video conference. I don't care. Um, who can tell us what the status of New York's is. Are they anticipating buying new equipment? You know, one of the requirements is going to be, one of the requirements, Michael, is going to be that as they buy new equipment, because a lot of these um, uh, companies, the, the equipment becomes obsolete, um, will be that the new equipment that they buy meets certain interoperability standards. And um, I do not believe that the people in Washington define complete interoperability the same way that you are. And I'm not an expert in this, so I can't answer your question. Yeah, so I guess a couple of things. One, it would be very helpful if you could let us know where you think we're missing anything, because we bought new equipment um, probably about five years ago. Um, we don't use a safest system anymore. We have a SABIS system. As I understand it, it is 100 percent interoperable with the FBI, that the FBI is getting fingerprints from every other state. So I'm not I'm having a hard time wrapping my hands around the place where you think there's a hole in our ability to check a latent print that one of our forensic labs is doing against any other latent print that's out there. So maybe is a practical matter if you can tell us where you think the shortcoming is, because as I look at it right now, 
you know, and I have gone back and looked at all this, and DCJS, in fact, runs the SABIS system. Um, you know, I think we're completely interoperable. I think we have the ability to and are comparing our latent prints from our accredited laboratories against everything in the country. So if there's a shortcoming, you know, by all means, help us, you know, point me to the right place, and we'll find someone to come in and talk about it. Fine. What I'll do is I'll, ref I'll refer you to the people of government who did the evaluation of each of the 50 states, and perhaps either you or somebody at your direction will uh, call that person, and he or she will explain to you what they what deficiencies they they observed. And we should certainly revisit that when your latent print group meets May or June. Was not was my understanding that lots of prints never get to save us. They get locally done, compared, dealt with, and never get uploaded, so never get mm -hmm. to save us, so never get to the FBI, so never get compared. But yeah, when you say lots of prints, I think we have to back up. And you know, As a commission, the only thing that we have authority over are latent print work that's done at an accredited forensic lab. So right. that's the starters. And secondly, you're right. If someone at an accredited lab is given a rolled inked print and given a latent print and asked to do a comparison, and two examiners look at it and say, that's it, and they make the decision not to run it through SABIS, then, yeah, it's not going to get compared. You know, the only way it gets compared is if someone says, yes, I'm going to run this through the SABIS system. But once that step is made, it runs against everything in the country. The unmatched, the unresolved at the local level get uploaded. If they're put, yes, as long as they're put into the system. All right, I think that finishes our old business. Actually, new business, I'm sorry. Um, so then. Barry, you had an issue that um, you wanted to raise under the topic of new business, I believe, as well. I did, yes. You want me to do that now? Yeah, I, I think it's as good a time as any. Uh, I attended the uh, meeting of the uh, DNA subcommittee, uh, I guess it's two weeks ago or something like that. Uh, and. Uh, much of the discussion there reflected what recently uh, came out, and I sent uh, you, Mike, uh, uh, a link to it, uh, draft guidelines for what is known as uh, probabilistic uh, genotyping and how to validate it uh, that was just issued by SWIGDAN, uh, which I think in some ways are similar to the general kinds of guidelines they've issued before. Uh, but uh, when you look at these uh, prop guidelines for uh, validating probabilistic genotyping, which includes internal validation studies, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, that might be very helpful uh, to the Commission as a whole, but particularly to the DNA subcommittee um, in their uh, review and discussions of uh, some of these uh, methodologies that are being brought to them. Uh, in, they just uh, uh, discussed but did not uh, uh, approve uh, STR mix at the last meeting. Um, and the first one that they approved was true allele. And uh, I think true allele uh, at this point has become extremely controversial. Uh, there's a number of uh, decisions out there where uh, the person that is uh, the, uh, I guess, the inventor, uh, or certainly the person that's going to make a profit on this particular methodology, Michael Perlin, uh, uh, when he will not reveal his underlying source code, which he claims to be a trade secret, he is not allowed to testify, uh, he, he refuses to testify when he, uh, uh, the, and uh, uh, this is, a, this is a troubling and controversial issue, but probably the most um, uh, mm -hmm. difficult problem we have is that uh, we all know from public reports uh, that uh, the New York State Crime Lab uh, has had to suspend people uh, for cheating on proficiency tests uh, mm -hmm. with respect to true allele. 
Um, and uh, this is disturbing. I think if you go back and look at the time that we had to do the mandatory approval of the DNA subcommittee uh, uh approval of true allele. I actually said at those meetings that I had a lot of trouble with it because he wouldn't reveal his source code, because uh, uh, of the way that he was going to make money on it, and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, I think that uh, this is such an issue of public concern. There have been editorials about it in newspapers across the state that it would be the better part of wisdom if this commission would uh, 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 take a vote and simply ask the DNA subcommittee to revisit uh, uh, their approval of uh, true allele. Anyone else have in any light of account? the new light of the new uh, suggested standards about probabilistic <laughs> genotyping uh, that have been put out for draft comment, and in light of uh, uh, the the scandals uh, to put not too fine a gloss on it. Uh, that we have uh, uh, at the New York State uh, Laboratory. Any other thoughts or comments on this topic? I get, oh, Can we get access to those um, guidelines to look at them? Barry, do you have any objection if we circulate what you sent us to all of the commission members? They're, they're public on the SWIGDAM yeah. website. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're and, public, and, and I sent them, I sent them to Fred Bieber, uh, immediately after the meeting, as soon as I saw them. And so it, it really is, uh, and what I said at the meeting, and I think is just true, is that all of the, the entire DNA community is struggling uh, uh, with all these different uh, methodologies. I've said to you many times, you know, you get one result with true allele, and one result with STR mix, and one result with armed expert, and one result with uh, uh, FST, and all these different uh, methodologies. Uh, and there has to be some way that we can be assured that they get validated. But I think the one where that just passed through in the first instance right away that is the most troublesome of all is true allele. And, and the other thing I really commend your attention to it is that uh, uh, there was a Virginia Capitol case where Perlin got on the witness stand and he said, this is all generally accepted. Uh, in the scientific community because the New York State Forensic Science Commission has approved true allele. And that includes people that are known to be, uh, uh, you know, critics and very hard-headed about uh, new methodologies. Uh, and Marvin Schechter went down uh, to testify at that hearing explaining that, you know, the commission members itself, uh, it's a mandatory and binding recommendation and cited some of the uh, problems that I expressed the day that true allele was mandatorily approved by us. And I just think that in terms of public confidence uh, in the work of the commission and particularly of the subcommittee, uh, they really deserve that. I think they would really benefit from uh, another look at true allele. That's all I'm asking. I'm not saying that we, you know, retract our approval right now. I think it should be sent back to the DNA subcommittee for review. Yes, one thought I have is that, um, you know, unless I'm wrong, I think the lab that has the biggest stake in this right now is the state police lab, um, and Superintendent D'Amico is not with us today. And I would, you know, personally at least, I'd like the opportunity to hear from him before we vote on this. Um, I, don't, I don't know how other people feel, but that's my own personal feeling. Other thoughts? Do you have any objection if we put this on for our next meeting, ask the state police to give us a, um update in terms of where they are with True Allele and what their feelings are, and then take a vote at that time after the superintendent and the state police have had an opportunity to weigh in as to whether or not we want to send it back? Well, I, uh, if you make a motion, we can vote on it right now. But I just uh, personally, I... I think it would be a good idea, since they have the biggest stake in it, to let them weigh in on it. But if you want to do it now, we'll do it now. You know, look, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to appear obstructionist about it. I, I just, the only reason I'm suggesting that we send it back now, uh, with the opportunity for uh, 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 the superintendent to to weigh in on it. Uh, 
is that it, it would save some time. I mean, you know, they, they, the, the, the people with the greatest, uh, presumably with the greatest expertise in this matter, would get a chance to revisit it. I'm sure that they have got to be as disturbed as, uh, you know, many people are uh, by this scandal and, and, and by the appearance of it. So my, my real suggestion is, and maybe we should take a vote on it, I just think for appearance, the appearance of uh, uh, a good practice and public confidence in the integrity of the process, it would make sense for the DNA subcommittee to look at it. Yeah, uh, yes. I, I mean, we, and if you make the motion, I guess we'll that's take my a motion. vote. Where I'm okay. coming from is everything I've heard about the scandal and everything I know about the scandal so far, um, as far as I know, does not relate to the science behind true allele and the validity of the science. Um, so, yeah, just based on that fact, you know, I don't know right now without hearing from the superintendent and hearing more from the state police lab, I would vote to send it back. But certainly if you make the motion, we'll entertain it and we'll vote. Right. And, and I, putting aside the issue of the science, the one thing it seems pretty clear uh, is that uh, it's one thing to have uh, uh, a method that arguably uh, is within the realm of uh, – uh, they may have some scientific value, but it's quite another and something that we look at all the time to make sure that the laboratory can actually administer it reliably. And what seems clear from the public reports of the investigation is that one of the reasons that people were cheating on the proficiency tests is that they couldn't understand true allele and administer it. And that is, in fact, uh, uh, to my mind, Mike, a science question and exactly the kind of internal validation uh, that's required by the uh, standards and something that the DNA subcommittee uh, should be looking at. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is uh, the, the most pointed questions that they were asking uh, uh, Jack Simic about STR mix, exactly how this could be administered and has to be a showing that you can really do it. And uh, that w that's what seems to be really at issue with true allele. They, they all had to cheat on the proficiency tests in order to demonstrate that they could actually use the methodology reliably. So I just submit to you, Mike, that is a science question. I don't mean to uh, uh, show disrespect to Superintendent D'Amico by making this motion now, but it just seems to me that uh, uh, this would give everybody some confidence that it's being looked at by, uh, uh, you know, the DNA experts. And I think, One you know, I, think hang on. I, I think you raise um, some points that are definitely um, worth looking at and that the commission needs to look at. I'm just personally indicating I'm going to vote against it um, only because I want to hear from the superintendent before we take that action. But that's just my own personal feeling. And, it's, you know, again, I, I think the points you raise are points that we need to look at as a commission. And just quickly to be clarifying, it's not proficiency tests or competency tests. They're distinctly different entities. Proficiency tests are administered to analysts that are already doing casework. Competency tests are administered to analysts that are in training. In this particular case, none of the analysts ever got through the training program, so we're never doing casework. It's a substantial difference. And at no time has there been any concern raised about the validity. And just the third thing is when we look at the SWIG Dam guidelines, which are draft at this point, they're just waiting for open public comment. Page one, paragraph two, second sentence specifically says these guidelines are not to be intended to be applied retroactively. So even if we applied these, if we, if we adopted these right now, you know, we don't get past second paragraph where it says don't use it on, on stuff that's historic. You know, the, 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 the amount of information that was done in the validation was extensive and has gone through it. So again, I don't mean to lecture anymore, but I will clearly vote against that. Any other discussion? Right. We have a motion on the table, as I understand it, to ask the DNA subcommittee to re-examine um, the approval that they gave or the binding recommendation that they gave approving the use of true allele. Um, do we have a second for that motion? Second. All right. We have it seconded. Question? Yes. Was that approval approval of the methodology generically? Or was it approval of the methodology as used by the state? It's lab. Do you recall? 
Is Steve still here? I think it's generic. Do you have any, do you have a recollection, generic. Steve? My, it's generic. My understanding is when something gets passed at the DNA subcommittee that a technology is approved, it's approved for anyone in the state to use that technology. It, it's right, not the, approval uh, of the validation by that lab of its use of that. They're looking at that validation by that lab, but once it's approved to be used in the state, it applies to any lab, and the okay. state can use sim that same technology. That's how it's been applied. It, so it's not directly it, it, to the police lab's <laughs> use or not use. It's related to the validity, the scientific validity of true allele which is exactly the question that Barry is raising about access to the underlying trade secret data that establishes the value of the analysis of the assay, right? Right. Okay. And, and it also, as I recall, correct, um, if Steve is in the room, uh, Mike, you can ask him. If I, if I recall correctly, it was the... Uh, uh, True Leo, the, it, its main uh, uh, customer uh, was the New York State Crime Lab, that, uh, and that they were the one lab in the state that was trying to use it and validate it internally uh, uh, for use in the state. So what uh, Dr. Corrado says, of course, uh, their recommendation means that after demonstrating to the uh, DNA subcommittee that they are that they have a valid technology and it can be internally validated and used in a, a crime laboratory. Then other uh, laboratories in the state could use True Allele, assuming they also could perform adequate internal validation. But they uh, don't have to bring that necessarily back to the DNA security, or maybe they do. I'm a little unclear about that. But the one thing it's clear to me is that the internal validation and the overall presentation about True Allele's validity was done through the New York State Crime Laboratory. Uh, and that's what also has, by the way, been their big trump card as they go across the country using this in different cases. And now that we know uh, that there's a serious scandal there and people were cheating on proficiency tests and its first dry run, I just think uh, uh, that it would be uh, wise for us uh, to ask the DNA subcommittee to go back and take a hard look at that. That's all. Um, one last thing. A Ann? Yes. Uh, just in terms, of, Ann, in terms of scientific process, uh, whether you call it proficiency tests or competency tests, uh, you, you're actually trying to get a handle, I, I would assume, on the reproducibility of this particular methodology among your laboratory personnel. And if you thought in the abstract that something was valid, but you subsequently receive information that it may not be operating in a reliable fashion, is that something that scientists would want to then take a second look at if they receive that kind of information? Well, for example, the Food and Drug Administration approves clinical laboratory assays as a cleared, um, accurate, and um, efficient and safe and effective laboratory test. Once they approve that technology, it can be adopted by any laboratory with minimum verification that it performs as specified by the manufacturer. So that was why my question, if we're approving the technology based on the data submitted by the developer of that technology, then its adoption by state police lab or any other lab would require documentation that when they use it, it gets the results that are expected. I disagree that proficiency tests are used to determine reproducibility of results with the intra-laboratory reproducibility of results. They're used to test the competency and capability of the laboratory in the clinical world and apparently of the individual analyst in the forensics world. But I, you know, the adoption of an assay that's been approved as technically valid is a different thing than 
how it works thereafter. The FDA requires reporting of adverse events. If it doesn't work well, but, but Ann, tell the FDA. If it doesn't work Ann, well, but he, Ann, but even, even, with, even with clinical actions, wouldn't you, wouldn't Clear or some other entity, if it got information that the laboratories were unable to use it Hang in a reproducible Peter. session? Wouldn't it be some federal agency or state agency that would then take a second look at the appropriateness of its use? We're having problems with the audio, and you keep breaking up and coming in again. Can you hang on a minute? In a, in a clinical sure. lab, Peter, um, you only run the PT once because it's the lab you're testing, not the individual technologist. So you don't use PT to compare reproducibility of the of the assay that you you don't run it multiple times with multiple analysts. You can only run it. No, no, well, all right. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me now, Mike? Yeah, I didn't get. Apparently, Ann was able to hear you better than I was. The screen was going black on us, and I, I didn't hear what you said that Ann responded to. It's not right. It's uh, fine with the I thought it was actually the uh, and, and, and Jim Coppersmith laughed. Um, so, no, no, the point I'm making, Ann, is that whether they're competency tests, whether they're uh, uh, some other kind of test, if in fact the regulatory entity receives information that a laboratory is having a serious problem using the methodology in a reliable fashion, okay, wouldn't some either federal or state agency then take a look at that problem? Wouldn't that be their responsibility? I don't care what you call the test. The tests definitely indicate that there's a problem with the New York State Laboratory that necessitates certain people who are being trained for it to, uh, uh, to cheat to in order to pass it. And you would think that the regulatory body responsible with oversight uh, would want to take a second look at things if, in light of that. If a method being used in a regulated clinical laboratory um, failed to meet quality control standards, no one was giving you out of range results, it wasn't giving you expected results on your control samples or whatever when you were running it, then yes, you would troubleshoot, do root cause analysis, and yes, at the time of inspection, the regulatory body would ask, did you identify a problem? Did you correct a problem? But, you know, it wouldn't be. Here's my, here's my, and here's my point. Let's not get confused between proficiency tests and validation, because I, I, I take your distinction. But it's my recollection that uh, part of the proof that was offered or we were told was uh, part of the group that was proper, to the DNA subcommittee for the validation and approval of uh, Trulio came from the work they did at the New York State Crime Lab, demonstrating that the technique could really produce reliable results. They were working with the New York State Police. That was a major thing. And we're not just having a failure of proficiency tests here, but we have is a suspension of 12 DNA analysts for cheating and uh, uh, a discussion of pressure uh, that was being put on people uh, with respect to this technology, which, if you recall, when Mary Houston came here, you know, uh, if you would make a license to a wheel, I think they said it costs uh, $125,000, which was the cost of an analyst. Was the whole presentation made about that. And all that I'm saying is that we should send it back to the DNA subcommittee so they can review this, because when you cheat, it raises a question about whether or not the underlying data that you got in the first instance was, was right. And that is someone? the kind of thing that I think is a regulatory body. You know, uh, it would be a wise course for us to send that back. We're not the people that should be reviewing whether or not it was something uh, uh, untoward with the underlying data that led to the validation of Twilio at the New York State Crime Lab. I'm not confident to do that. Maybe Ann Walsh is, but uh, that's something. Uh, and, yeah. and I can't even remember on the uh, subcommittee who 
we always uh, make it with the blue and handle the car. <clears throat> Before we go any further with this, we have Director Ray Wickenheiser from the State Police Lab here who is asked to speak. I'm going to recognize him and let him speak for a minute. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Green. Uh, just if I could correct a few uh, uh, statements that were made. Uh, one is uh, there's absolutely no issue with any of the validations we have done, absolutely no issue with the technology itself. This is strictly an ethics and integrity matter. Uh, with respect to exam information, which will be dealt with in the executive session. So there's nothing we have uncovered that goes to the validity in any way, shape, or form for the actual technology of probabilistic genotyping or true allele itself. Um, these are, are not even competency tests. These are tests that are prerequisites as people move through their training. People can, in an unauthorized fashion, share test information any discipline. They can do it with respect to any uh, particular topic. It is absolutely a personnel matter, uh, but just to give um, the, uh, the Commission some additional information, uh, this subject was actually dealt with in a Schenectady court uh, the week of February 9th. Uh, Wakefield um, uh, is the trial, uh, and in that, Judge uh, Kukoma um, actually ruled that this particular investigation in it, we had not only the person who did all of our validations testified before the judge, uh, we had Major Monroe who testified as to what actually occurred in the events, uh, as well as the then director of biosciences, uh, Barry Deuceman, testified as well. It was extremely thorough. Uh, the judge uh, independently determined that this had nothing to do with the integrity of true allele itself, that it strictly was uh, a personnel matter. So uh, there's absolutely um, our position that is what it is, and certainly we'll do everything that is necessary on the, on the personnel side. Uh, further to what was actually approved, and um, Major Monroe has the exact wording, uh, true allele was approved strictly for New York State Police to use at this time. Now, I'm sure that would pave the way for other areas. Uh, Kern County is using, in California, has been using True Allele um, for over a year without any issue, and so has Virginia State Police. I'm sure they refer to our studies, uh, but as I said, those have uh, been done appropriately. Uh, to me, they stand up in court, and it's a very valid technique. Any questions from the Commission? I'd, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them. But, Ray, when you, when you look at the, the Wakefield decision, you see that the, it, it's kind of circular because the judge said, I find that true will is generally accepted in the scientific community because the New York State DNA subcommittee, composed of all these uh, scientists uh, who are respected in the community, approved it. Uh, and I'm not sure, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that he had all the information that led to the suspension of all of these new analysts. And so, uh, it does seem to me, I didn't read in the, uh, you know, I don't want to get into anything that's in executive session. I just want to talk about what I read in the newspapers that's publicly known. But uh, is it the Inspector General conducting an investigation here? So my only point is that uh, uh, it may well turn out to be that uh, what you're saying is true about its validation. Um, although I think there are some substantial questions I've seen scientists raise. Uh, but I'm not by any means comforted by a decision that's kind of circular. Uh, and all that I'm saying is that uh, uh, in light of uh, what happened here, and given the fact that so much of the approval of Trulio is based on the New York State uh, uh, Laboratory's uh, uh, own work and validation of it, that out of an abundance of caution, the subcommittee should go back and look and make sure that that data uh, is, is completely legitimate. Well, um, further to that, uh, further to that, we presented uh, that information executive session to the DNA subcommittee two weeks ago. They had no issue um, knowing the information with what we have done. Certainly, I'm sure the judge is aware of um, what the approval was by the DNA subcommittee, which is a renowned panel unto themselves, a number of uh, very learned people in the, in the DNA com community. So I have trust in their competency and what they're you know, going to uh, determine. And I'm sure while the judge knows what the approval is, he had uh, Jay Caponero, who has done all of our validations, and he testified extensively before the judge and asked and answered, excuse me, answered any questions he had, and certainly to the judge's satisfaction. I'm just giving you that because that's an indeterm 
a independent determination uh, by somebody who has no vested interest in, in certainly it's a fry hearing it's up to him to determine whether it meets the new york legal standard to him it did and he determined there was no issue with the technology and it strictly was a personnel investigation which is certainly something we take seriously we're dealing with it uh, but it is strictly an integrity and ethics uh, issue hey barry it just seems like the analogy here is if someone cheats on the bar exam that you say the underlying law is invalid i don't see the connection well, Brian, just if i can be helpful uh, just a question for you. Um, this, this, oh, come sorry. Um, just intuitively, uh, and Brian, if one person cheats on the exam, it's probably a personnel issue. If a dozen people cheat on an exam, it raises systemic issues, generally the kind of things that are addressed in a root cause analysis, and not simply personnel issues. And I'm a little bit surprised that somebody would characterize a cheating scandal of this magnitude as simple, as simply personnel and integrity issues, and not thinking that there might be systemic issues that would have to be dealt with as well. All right, we have a motion on the table. Um, the motion's been seconded. We've had discussion before we take a vote. Is there anything else? All right, everyone in favor. One, two. Everyone opposed? One, two, three, four, five. I can't see Marina. Our screen keeps going black. All right, I opposed. All right, so that motion, um, did you vote? All right, Anne's abstaining. All right. Um, and Barry, I would say, if you want to raise it again at the next meeting with the superintendent, um, you know, and hopefully we'll have more information by then from the state police lab um, in terms of where we are with the investigation. And I think, as you indicated, I do believe, well, I shouldn't say I believe, um, I know the IG is looking into the matter as well because there's a representative from the IG's office here. Um, so maybe we'll have more information from them at that time too. The next item we have, I believe, are lab disclosures. Um, Brian, do you want to take us through the lab disclosures? Sure. There are uh, a number of uh, disclosures from labs throughout the state. So we have directors. I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, go through them. Uh, I want to get the appropriate documentation in front of me. So the first one we have on our agenda is from Erie County. We have Dr. Simich here, and you have the information in your binders if anyone has any questions. Um, the only question I would have of uh, Dr. Simich is, uh, since it says that the your root cause analysis could not determine the root cause, um, I was wondering, do you have a, a formal um, written protocol on how you conduct your root cause analysis? Yes, it's in the documentation that you have. We provided all of the uh, root cause documentation, the format that our quality management follows, uh, and the protocol that's used is in the form that uh, are provided in your packet. And that was also provided to ASCLAD Lab uh, as our part of our closeout. <coughs> Any other questions for Dr. Simich? Just so I'm clear, you're, the document you referred to, it's got root cause analysis on the top, and it's like it's a three column chart. Yeah, multiple and there's pages. Different uh, subtopics within that to find the problem in the problem statement. An, an event timeline has been developed. Uh, there's a potential causal factor checklist that the uh, quality manager utilizes. Obviously, it's a checklist of possible things, so not all of those apply to any every particular situation. Uh, just some standard things that could be potential for any type of case. And then there's an action item list that she will then uh, follow. 
uh, after we discussed it and uh, our plan, uh, along with the data collection plan and what was done, and then the uh, final uh, completion of the potential causal factors um, that uh, we were able to discern and whether they were supported or not supported. That's the final set of page of that document. As a result of this, um, did you do any, you know, was there direction or training or anything to staff with regards to this issue? Uh, well, we reminded them that they need to scan each particular item and verify it is there when they are transferring it. And coincidentally, a couple years ago, we modified the procedure for storing of firearms-related evidence, uh, components such as magazines or ammunition. They are actually no longer stored with the firearm, the long arm, in the same bag. They're actually in separate bags. So this uh, incident would be impossible to repeat uh, with the current procedure that we have had in place for at least a couple of years now. All right. Now, are you currently waiting to hear back from ASCLAD Lab with regard to the action you've taken? No, they've accepted it, and that is included in the documentation. The email that I received from them, I included a copy of that. Uh, that's actually right after the last root cause page. Uh, where they've uh, accepted the. Uh... Okay, I see it. That's. Okay. All right, thank well, you. Actually, that's not the confirmation. No, that's uh, not. The, uh, that, that's the original email. Um, the confirmation should be in there. I did forward it to BCBS. All right, thank you. Anything else on this item? I uh, just another question. I'm sorry, Doctor. You, you did say that you, your protocol and procedures for how you conduct an RCA or any materials. Are you referring to uh, the document that you call RCA that has the what, when, where? Is that the document? No, this this is. Because I don't see I don't see any document here. I'm sorry. I may be missing it. Where it actually describes the the manner in which the methodology utilized. Are you a laboratory when you conduct an RCA? We do have that protocol in our manual. Yes, there's a policy for that. I'm sorry. Uh, there's a policy for root cause analysis and uh, any type of quality issues that is in our quality manual that the quality manager will follow. It's kind of it's meets uh, ASCLAD so, lab or ISO accreditation guidelines. Well, ISO doesn't tell you how to conduct a root cause analysis. ISO just tells you to do one. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is that you might want to confer with other people. I know the ASCLAD lab is offering a training program now to help its membership laboratories conduct rigorous root cause analysis. You might also want to talk to folks at the OCME in New York who have worked out uh, an internal sort of very detailed procedure protocol for how they're doing it. Um, there's a lot to learn in this area, and, and I don't think that the um, documents produced for us sort of lay that out with any kind of sufficient specificity so that we can appreciate the methodology. All right, anything further? All right, thank you. Okay. The next item is actually a follow-up of a previous item uh, from the Erie County Talks Lab. Uh, we have the director here. If there's any questions about that, the documentation's in your binder. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Next item is Nassau County Office of Chief Medical Examiner in New York City. We have Dr. Buffalino and Karen Dooling there. If there's any questions. And just as an aside, while we're mulling over that, I got a little email from the IT tech support just asking if we can all talk a little slower because the video link seems to be a little um, fuzzy. So this will just make sure everyone can hear what's going on. If there are no questions for the Nassau County uh, Medical Examiner's Lab, there's also the Nassau County Office of Medical Examiner Toxicology Lab. Documents in your binder. 
I believe Dr. Avila is in New York City if you have questions. Okay, next item is New York City Police Department Laboratory. Dr. Scott O'Neill in New York City if you have any questions. Okay. Next item, New York State Police Crime Laboratory. There, uh, Ray Wick and Hazard, Tim Monroe, Major Monroe, up here in Albany, uh, if any questions are anticipated. Okay, New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner Toxicology. Uh, members in New York City, if there's any questions. Onondaga County Center of Forensic Sciences, uh, Services, sorry, Dr. Science. Corrado, Sciences? Yeah, okay, Sciences, I'm sorry. sorry. Little correction there. Uh, forensic Sciences, Dr. Corrado in Albany, if any questions? Okay, Suffolk County Crime Laboratory, Director Jenna uh, in, and I believe Connie Dinkle in New York City, if there's any questions. And last under this section, we've got the Westchester uh, DPS. We have the QA manager and the, one of the directors here in uh, Albany if there's any questions. And if not, that concludes the lab disclosure section of the agenda. I, I know we went through them quickly, so we, you know, if people want a few minutes, that's fine. Otherwise, we can move on. Anyone feel they need more time before we move on? Is there audio to New York just to make sure we're getting a response? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bueller, Bueller, go, let's go. All right, um, the next thing we have is executive session. Um, do I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss matters relating to either current investigation or matters that may lead to the appointment, promotion, demotion, discipline, or suspension of a particular person? Do I have a second? Yes. All right, all in favor? Anyone opposed? All right, we will go into executive session. Um, at this point, I would ask anyone who is. Hey, Greg, are we good? Okay, yeah. Yep. All right, there was no um, official action in executive session that needs to be reported here. Um, with that said, do we have a motion to adjourn? All right, do we have a second? All right, all in favor? All right, thank you, everybody. I appreciate everyone's participation and help here.